हेलो यस सर कैन एनीवन कंफर्म एम आई ऑडिबल यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल यस सर जस्ट सर टू मिनट्स विल स्टार्ट एट वन थर्टी ओके थैंक्स फॉर द कंफर्मेशन आई हैव जॉइंट ओके सर थैंक यू वेरी मच Hello, Dr. Jatinder. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay, Dr. Jatinder. I have session seven. So may I know where? How do I go to session seven then? S seven. S seven. Yes. That is on a, like uh, next day tomorrow. Yeah, but here it says uh, uh, in track one, which is what's on the nine. What's your paper ID? uh it's uh, let me tell you it is 287 287 yes yeah. it's not in pink color it's in blue color uh, so that's a, uh, your paper is on the next uh, tomorrow okay so not today it's i was uh, no. because in a schedule it is written on uh, like on a header side that is a uh, day 1 and day 2 right so where how can i go there tomorrow you have to present your paper okay are you sure about that because you see here it says in in the schedule which has given to us just, it just says which schedule paper track paper 1 ID 96 paper id paper id 287 287 yeah but it says just, track 1 one minute Hello, Doctor Battle. Just a minute, sir. Hello, Doctor Battle. Yes. Uh, my paper two ninety six. What's your query? Okay, start ready two ninety six. Yeah. Uh, paper two eighty seven is uh, tomorrow at one. Yeah, tomorrow. So I've seen it checked earlier. Yeah. So, uh, so I'll be coming back tomorrow. Then. Thank you so much. What about others? Other author? Hello. Yes. Um, Hello. Uh, my, my my paper ID one twenty nine and one twenty nine. Yes, your uh, says uh, this like your paper is in the uh, next uh, session. That is S three. Yes, sir. You are the presenter. Are you the presenter for the author? Uh, for yes, this sir. Paper? Yes, okay. sir. So I will make you the presenter. No problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, dear sir. Yes. Is the paper ID two forty two? Two forty two. Yes, sir. Doctor, uh, my paper Hello, ID two nine. Paper ID is one three six. Check in a schedule, please. Yeah. I am requesting you, all of you. Excuse me, sir. My paper is in this session. Its ID is three zero five. So I wanted myself to be the presenter. My paper is. Yeah. I will take you after first uh, paper is over. That is one twenty nine. Okay. Thank I you. I request for other author those who are querying for their paper, please uh, refer the schedule. that is posted on this uh, website conference website there are two two schedules uh, schedule 1 is for track 
and schedule two is for track two. So please refer that schedule. Okay, everyone. Okay, I'm ready. Two nine six. ID. Two nine six. Two nine six. Two nine six is in uh, this uh, next session. That is S three. Your paper is fourth yes. one. So we remain present here. Abhi. Okay. Doctor Ali. Okay, Doctor Batel. Yes. Remain here. Remain here. Okay. Okay. I think we we can start this uh, session as three. So <clears throat> let me uh, welcome Dr. Jatinder Kumar uh, Saini. He is a professor at uh, Symbiosis International uh, uh, University, Pune. His area of research is NLP, natural language processing, web and text mining, and document analysis. I welcome you, sir, on this IC Softcom 2022 as a session chair. In this session, we have five papers. Dr. Saini. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Thanks for uh, inviting me for this session. Uh, let us proceed with this session. Please go ahead, sir. I hand over this uh, session to you, sir. A uh, first paper is a 129 with a paper ID 129. Author is B.K. Misra. Dr. Misra, you are the presenter, so you can start your presentation and share with us. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. You will get uh, 10 minutes. You will get 10 okay. minutes to present your okay. paper. So that's sir, uh, yes, sir. Just, just confirm me that my screen is visible and I am audible or not, sir. You are audible, but your screen is not visible right now. I have already shared. Okay, share again. Please unshare and share again. Now, can you confirm this? No, Dr. Misra. We cannot see your screen. Have you shared the presentation, PPD? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have shared that. Uh... Uh, audience, sir, can you see the PPT slide? No, sir. No, no uh, it's not visible. Dr. Misra, you just unshare on the PPT presentation and again share it. Okay. Okay, sir. Now, can you confirm this? Sir? Not visible. Not visible. Uh, no, this uh, screen is not visible. Uh, Dr. Patel, can we have the next person? So I suggest uh, Dr. Mishra to log out and log in again. So meanwhile, we can have the next presentation if it is possible. Dr. Mishra, just, is just, just give me one, one minute so that if it is possible. Because from morning, uh, 10 o'clock, I am waiting for this. Okay, only one minute. <laughs> no. You have one minute. Okay. Now, can you confirm me? <clears throat> no, your uh, PPT is not visible. Let me share your PPT from here. Okay. I can share your PPT, just a minute. You can start your presentation, no problem. Okay, sir. Okay. Just try to complete your presentation in the... Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Because from morning, uh, from uh, 10 o'clock, uh, I am Yes, yes, I can understand. I can. Yes, can you see the PPT? Just a minute, sir. Yes, sir, it is visible. Dr. Mishra. But, uh, no, sir, I am not able to see. You can present from your PPT, no problem. 
ఓకే సార్ ఓకే సో గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ టు వన్ అండ్ ఆల్ ప్రెసెంట్ హియర్ ఐ ఎమ్ వినోద్ కుమార్ మిశ్రా అండ్ ఐ ఎమ్ గివింగ్ ప్రజెంటేషన్ ఫర్ మై టాపిక్ ఇస్ వర్డ్ సెన్స్ డిసిమ్బిగ్యుయేషన్ ఫ్రమ్ ఇంగ్లీష్ టు ఇండిక్ లాంగ్వేజ్ అండ్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద అప్రోచ్ ఇట్ అండ్ అపర్చునిటీ ఆర్ దే ఐ సో హియర్ ఐ ఎమ్ ఫోక్సింగ్ సో ద కంటెంట్ ఆఫ్ ద పేపర్ ఇస్ ఇంట్రొడక్షన్ నీడ్ ఫర్ వర్డ్ సెన్స్ డిసిమ్బిగ్యుయేషన్ లిటరేచర్ సర్వే మెథడాలజీ implementation result conclusion and references are there so word sense disambiguation is a task to identify the correct meaning of words in a given context using computational manner so suppose if i will take one example that in english sentence that is i went to bank to withdraw some money and a students are playing football near the bank river so in both sentence bank is the common word but the meaning is different one is related to financial institution and the other is related to the river bank the same word if i will take uh, because here in both both place the it is the same part of his speech are there but suppose if i will take like the bank near the ng road was robbed and the bank near the road is too steep and is very dangerous so again here the bank common word are there but the meaning is entirely different are there next is if i will take another word uh, use, uh, like chair and chair is again the ambiguous word ambiguous word is just like the polysemous word having more than one meaning and the meaning will change according to the context Mr. of sorry yes, for interrupting you yes sir yes sir please are you which slide uh currently we are uh, like uh, displaying your slide number 5 need for the word sense disabling uh, uh, just just a minute sir just a minute uh, this thing is not mentioned in the slide that's why uh, uh, it is not there so are you on which slide dr patel no problem let him continue i will synchronize no problem okay okay Dr. Mishra, continue, please. Okay, sir. Thank, thank, thank you for your cooperation, sir. Thank you. So, uh, the, the same thing, uh, this ambiguity problem not in the English language, but also in the Hindi language. Uh, and for example, that, Yeh aam rasta nahi hai, and aam mitha phal hota hai. So, in, in the first sentence, like, the, Yeh aam rasta nahi hai, the meaning is different. compared to the aam mitha phal one is related to the path and the other common root and the other is related to the fruit sense so the motivation of my research is that if we studied uh, if uh, for uh, any language like natural language so we have to solve the ambiguity problem and the ambiguity problem shown by uh, by the researcher is used only for the english and other foreign language like chinese japanese and other thing but very less work are accomplished for the hindi as well as the other indian language due to lot of services initiated by the government of india like healthcare pension application digital payment system or any other system they used Uh, to create service for their citizenship their citizen and if we want to give proper service then it must require to process this natural language and for this natural language we have already seen that lot of word having it comes under the category of the polysemous word so we had to solve this problem otherwise it is it the, the service is not properly utilized then uh, next uh, there are two category of the word sense disambiguation one word one is that is known as lexical or single word wst and the other is all word wst so in lexical or single word wst is uh, in a particular sentence if only one word is ambiguous or polysemous word then it comes under the part of this category but if in a single sentence if more than one words represent as the polysemous word then it comes under the category of all word wst so for this solving this problem 
we require different resources. One is known as word, uh, WordNet. Uh, since my work is related to the Hindi word, so here I am using Indo WordNet that is developed by IIT Bombay. And another type of resources that is known as illuminated corpus as well as the uh, raw corpus is there. So there are three categories of the word sense distribution. One is knowledge based WST approach require uh, some rule specification rules, supervised approach that is required sense enumerated corpus and unsupervised WST approach require unenumerated corpus is there. Now for each, each different approach, we have to use either in the form of rule based or sense enumerated or unenumerated corpus. So some of the literature survey I have studied and uh, all these uh, I have studied and collected. So some of the focus it in English language or in Hindi language also. And the accuracy is not up to mark for the Hindi language. So that's why I have initiated for these services. Uh, so this is my blog diagram. If you observe, sir, can you shift it to the methodology part so that everybody can understand? Yes, these are methodology. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So in methodology slide, if there are three steps are there. One is create what to make vector embedding matrix. Uh, are you able to see, sir? Can you yes. inform me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Thank, thank you for your uh, confirmation. And the second step is that create context and sense vector representation. And the third step that is build machine learning model. So in step one, create a word vector embedding matrix. First of all, we have to build corpus. This corpus creation is very, very important. And this requires huge amount of the time because since very less work are done, have been done for this Hindi language. So this is my first challenge for building the corpus. So we have taken information from the news website, some, some, of the, uh, some of the information we have collected from the different resources like textbook, and after that, we apply pre-processing for this whole corpus. This pre-processing may be the removal of a stock word, a special symbol, number, and a stemming also we have applied. Since Hindi is a rich morphology language, like kha jayenge, khayega, kha rahega, for the, all these words having the single word, and that we accomplished using the stemming process. After that, after accomplish this pre-processing, we, we have converted all these words into the vector form. Little later, I will explain the vector, different vectorization method. And here for this thing, we have used word to vec approach that is developed by Google scientist uh, Mikolo in 2014. And then after converting this each word into the vector form, when we give one input sentence, in this input sentence, we should apply the pre-processing steps, the same okay. steps. Krishna, same I steps. sorry, I am interrupting you in between. Uh, you are almost about to complete 10 minutes. Can you please uh, proceed for the conclusion within next okay. minute? Oh, oh, okay, okay, sir. Okay, 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 sir. So these are the steps. This is the word to make approach. And after converting this word, these are the uh, representation of the two dimensional space. Some result are there. Here the main important part here, if we apply rule based approach, then accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score are mentioned. Some naive based approach like classical machine learning approach. The accuracy are little bit improved from the rule based and when we apply neural network like RNN model, then the accuracy is little bit uh, improved. So these are the graph are there and some result I have tested for this model in Amo ka swad bhoot acha hai and the, after removing this arm swad bhoot acha and the, it will predict the meaning. These are the result are there. And the conclusion of this that we, using this model, we can 
apply this model to any nlp application since whd approach is is the intermediate task and you should apply this task to any 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 application which will give the better service so these are the references we have used for my research uh, thank you sir any question please yeah uh, thanks for concluding within time any questions from the participants questions from the audience no it seems that there are no questions from the audience uh, dr mishu i have uh, two questions uh, question number 1 what is the size of the data that you have used for experimentation uh, sir i uh, since i have worked for the 20 ambiguous word and for the each word i have collected almost 12000 to 15000 sentences okay so that's really appreciable my second question is now a lot of work has been done in the area of uh, hindi word sense disambiguation and in fact so is the case with many other uh, indo aryan languages also so i just wanted to know how can you compare the results of your algorithm with the results of the algorithms which are already existing in the contemporary literature yes, sir in the comparison part i have compared because many work have been done using classical machine learning like naive based support vector machine or unsupervised approach like uh, uh, k means algorithm and other approach very less work are done using the neural network approach like rna and the advanced technology like lstm by lstm so i uh, first of all i have developed rna model and it is after uh, one month or two months i want to use uh, using bot model or some other word embedding technique but till now very less work has been done uh, using any neural network technique डॉक्टर Miss Sargam Gupta, are you there? Yes, I am there. Yes, I am here. I am making you the presenter. Yes, thank you. Just a minute. Yes, you are presenter now. Okay. Dr. Patel, can you please stop sharing the PPT? Yes. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Turn to the presentation mode. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Present here. I am going to present my paper Fed Plus Federated Clustering from Distributed Homogeneous Data. My paper ID is 305 and I have worked with collaboration of Dr. Shachi Sharma and we both are affiliated to South Asian University. Coming to the content list, I would discuss the major difference between a classical machine learning algorithm and a federated learning algorithm, what are the types of federated learning, some related work and the research gaps. my problem statement and my method with some experiments and results and of course the conclusion so coming to the classical machine learning algorithm and a federated learning algorithm in the classical machine learning algorithm we have to store all the data on a central server and hence it lacks privacy and definitely a communication between the different clients cannot be made and hence a model is created with a lack of privacy and a lot of storage space is required for that while in case of a federated learning algorithm we do not share the exact data rather we share some kind of parameters from that data and hence we use a, to build a model by collaboration of different clients there are three major types of federated learning algorithms on the basis of data partition these are horizontal federated learning vertical federated learning and federated transfer learning 
In horizontal federated learning, we have a same feature space of the data, but these data differ in the user space. In the vertical federated learning, it's entirely opposite of the horizontal federated learning. We have the same user space, but different feature space, while a federated transfer learning is, is a mix of both these two. Now, while working through the literature surveys, I could see that there was a lot of research gap related to clustering applied in the federated environment. Most of the work was mostly focused on some deep learning based techniques where we could update the weights or there was some work on the redu reduction of communication cost between the participating nodes and the controllers. Some work also ensured some kind of privacy or of the security of the gradients and the model. And there were some algorithms which were uh, giving a better convergence as compared to the classical ML algorithms. But one point that was very unexplored was how to solve the clustering problem in the federated environment. In fact, most of the work that was even done for unsupervised learning was majorly doing some labeling of the unsupervised data and then using a classification technique in the federated environment for the same. Also in some algorithms, there was not a solid aggregation algorithm proposed. I have referred to three major works in the clustering environment in federated versions. These are KFED algorithm by Dennis Attell. Another one is the combination of popular K-means algorithm and mini batch K-means algorithm. And the third one is the gans based approach in which they have used some surrogate uh, yeah. labels some federated classification on that. In all these works, we could see that either they have used some standard algorithm as the aggregation algorithm, which is not strong enough, or they have used some kind of surrogate labels for that work. Also, the work has not been compared using the standard measures of clustering, like the cluster sizes and the number of clusters. So here I propose my work. This paper contributes by proposing a new horizontal federated clustering method called as FedClus, which can generate arbitrary shaped clusters from distributed data. And it provides a sound aggregation procedure at the server with the capability to merge, retain, and delete the clusters. We have also performed a detailed analysis of the FedClus algorithm. So my FedClus algorithm is a two-step algorithm, like we have a client algorithm and we have a server algorithm. On the client end, we have modified the standard DV scan algorithm to generate some parameters which would be shared with the server. So first we would run the DV scan algorithm on our partition data on each client, and then we calculate the centroid of that cluster by using the mean. Then we calculate the radius of each cluster by finding the distance of each point from the mean and assigning the maximum of all the distances as the radius of that cluster. We also calculate the density of a cluster by using the n-sphere surface formula for calculating the surface area. This formula is mentioned on the slides. And then for calculating the density, we have used the generic formula of dividing the number of points by the surface area. We share all these parameters with the server rather than the original data. Now coming to the server side algorithm, it is the heart of our work and I have explained it in a pictorial form. So we basically have this kind of cluster information from different clients. They would send us the centroid of the cluster, the radii of the cluster, the number of points in that cluster and density. A single client can send multiple cluster information as well, or it might not send even a single cluster information, depend on the DVSM algorithm performed on the client. Now, after getting this information, we organize this information in the form of a data structure. Then we calculate the distance between the centers of the cluster pairs. This is done for every cluster, like for all the clusters with other clusters, and we delete the distance between the cluster with itself, like cluster one with cluster one would not would obviously be zero. So that is deleted from this table mm -hmm. and we calculate this whole table and then sort this, this this table on the basis of ascending order of the distance, which means that the clusters which are near to each other would come on the top of the table, while the clusters which are smaller would come by the, by the bottom of the table. 
Now, this is the main rule that we have used to decide whether we have to merge the clusters, we have to delete a cluster, or we have to retain just one cluster out of it. We would calculate, we have calculated three major cases. That is when the sum of the radii of the two clusters is greater than the distance between their centers. If that is the case, then these two clusters could be overlapping. And then now this overlapping case could be something like you can see in the second image in which one cluster is within the other cluster and they can also vary in the size and density. So for that, we, we first check this condition and then we check if one cluster is very, very large and has a large density as compared to the other. In that case, we only retain the large cluster and and delete the smaller cluster while if they are of some comparable size then we merge them similarly a case two occurs in which we Sardam, check uh, i think you need to speed up a bit we just have three minutes left okay then we check the sum of the radii if it is less than the distance between their centers then these clusters are called as far apart and we keep them both and when if they are touching to each other we merge them the algorithm is mentioned in the paper and this is the merging algorithm that we use for merging. We basically add the number of points in the both clusters. Then the sum is taken as the radii so that no point is left and we calculate the surface area using the same formula. So we have used four benchmarking data sets for the evaluation of our work. These data sets vary in different forms like some have spherical and non-spherical clusters, some are sparse and dense clusters. Some are asymmetric and some are randomly placed clusters. We have not specifically divided our data set using some IID or non-IID properties. Rather, we have randomly divided the data between different clients by giving them equal number of records. This is the results that we have obtained from our work. We have compared our work with the standard dbscan algorithm. We can clearly see that even after increasing the number of clients, our work, our algorithm could almost get a similar number of clusters as that of the standard dbscan algorithms though we can see a slightly reducing average cluster size this is because since the data is being divided in more clients then more points are being thrown out as outliers and hence the size of the cluster is reduced this is but still it is able to maintain the properties being sent by the DB, by the db scan and hence preserving the privacy without sharing the exact data we have also plotted this information for on the on a graph and you can clearly see that we have plotted the centroids and it is able to match the pattern of the standard db scan algorithm this is for the s1 data set where in some cases the some of the clusters are not identified as well because this could be the, the random distribution of the points that these points are randomly distributed between different clients and hence it has caused a lot of distribution and all those points were considered as outliers. This, these are the results for the asymmetric data set. Now I would like to conclude that we have proposed a novel fed plus algorithm which is able to learn clusters from distributed unlabeled data and hence it preserves the privacy because we don't share the exact data. Also it is a one shot algorithm and hence reduces the communication cost. We have also done a robust algorithm, a robustness of the algorithm by checking it on various benchmarking data sets. In future we aim to test this on the real experimental setup. These are a few references that I've referred to. Thank you. Thanks, Sagam, for your presentation. Uh, I have uh, three questions, rather three concerns about the uh, research work that you have presented. Yes. Uh, number, number one is about the privacy concerns, particularly when you are getting the data from each client. Number two, did you compare the time performance of the proposed algorithm with the other existing algorithms and uh, number three is about the emphasis that you are laying on the word distributed because uh, most of the time when we talk about federated clustering distributed is something which is inherent and implicit so can you answer these three concerns like when comparing uh, first about the security like privacy concern when we are getting the data we are not exactly getting the data we are only getting some mm -hmm. parameters or properties so i i think this this is much more secure as compared to getting the exact information from the client 
coming to the time comparison as of now we have not done but we would definitely try to do that in our future work and uh, as far as distributed is concerned that we are using we are emphasizing on the word distributed as we are not exactly like taking different different work. we have performed a simulation so we are taking a large data set and then dividing it between the clients so that's why we are emphasizing on the word distributed uh, any questions from the participants Okay, uh, thank you, Satyam. Just take care of the time performance part. It was a good presentation. Uh, you can stop sharing. We move on to the third presentation for the session for paper ID 101, Corpus Building for Hate Speech Detection of Gujarati Language. Paper ID 101. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Let me make you the presenter. So we can share your PT. You are presented now. You can make a. You can share your PPT. Abhilasha, just keep an eye on time. Try to wind up your discussion within ten minutes. Sure, sir. Thank you. So my screen is visible. Yes, your screen is visible. Okay. Good afternoon, all of you. <clears throat> I'm Abhilasha Desai. My topic is uh, Corpus Building for Hate Speech Detection of Gujarati Language. Uh, first of all, what is the hate speech? Let me tell you that uh, we can see that nowadays the many uh, users, or the, we can see that the uh, whole population use their social media and posting their expression on the social media, right? So uh, what is first of all hate speech? So we can see that the, that is a one type of expression that harassing, abusing, that insect the violence, creates the heteroness or the discriminations against the group, target group characters like region, uh, race, place of origin, caste, community, uh, region, personal con convenience or a sexual orientation are termed as a hate speech, right? So uh, there is there is a one survey which is done by the uh, Facebook and the many social media handlers that is uh, they just uh, I mean detect the uh, kind of a hate speech which is related to any religion or a personal or a group and they just try to uh, remove it from their social site right so that is one of the reason to identify the hate speech detection over here in this paper I have just created one corpus which is related to the Gujarati language. Uh, now, uh, till now, there's a no data set has been done or created yet. Uh, so I have created, there are many languages like Germ German and English, Hindi, uh, Arabic, and many more languages are there. On on that, the expert detection is done. Now here, uh, if I uh, start with the Gujarati language, so how we can identify first of all as a human that what is hate speech, right? So suppose, uh, for example, I, I have just written that over here one example that uh, if there is a, any term or we can say that any word which is abusive or we can say that which is uh, like a kind of the abusive things and uh, if any person target to the another person or a group, then we can consider that as the hate speech. For example, over here, uh, like, uh, Right, so that is a one type of hate speech. Why? Because of over here, there is a um, uh, there is a person who is targeting uh, like uh, the third person and uh, like uh, I mean uh, use the uh, uh, we can say that or we can say that uh, the person target the another person, right? Uh, another thing that uh, Sala Karmachari, uh, Sala Sarkari Karmachari ne Mafat Pagar Jujitsa, right? So over here, uh, we can consider this first word that is Sala that that consider a word, abusive word in the Gujarati. So uh, that is a kind of, kind of the hate speech uh, are in the social, social media. Uh, as I did the survey, 40% uh, internet net, uh, pretension in India. Uh, another thing is uh, why I chose uh, social media data. So uh, that is one of the reason that to 
141 million users on Facebook alone. 136 million Indians are active on social users. 200 million WhatsApp users in India. So that is the one of the reason I chose the um, social media uh, for my data set. Uh, I have just uh, taken the data from the Twitter with the help of Twitter API. As you uh, as you can see over here, this is one of the screenshot of uh, Twitter handlers where many people just share their um, thoughts over here and they they can also do a tweet in the gujarati also uh, i mean what has not been done so far in automatic heads distraction so uh, over here i have just uh, uh, did the uh, systematic literature survey where i i can um, yes i i just uh, written over here that uh, how much uh, work has been done in the hate speech detection. So you can see there are Kareem and Dezul Ali proposed the uh, hate speech detection for under a resource of Bengali language also, right? So uh, there, uh, the thing has been done in the German also, Arabic tweet also, even though I have just mentioned um, the different different data set as well as their uh, different different class uh, classification over here. Um, there are uh, many, uh, uh, I mean, many things has been done on a Twitter data. Uh, as we can see that um, binary hate speech, it means that uh, the task, yes, over here, first of all, that is the reference ID, then the data set, that is the Twitter. Uh, task, it means the binary. Binary means uh, they just classified either it is hate no, or not. Sorry, sir. Sorry, Hello. Come to your work, please. Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that has been done already. Over here, uh, what I have created, I have just uh, collect the uh, tweet from the January 2022 to January 2021. I've gathered the uh, 12,000 uh, tweets with the help of Twitter API. And I have just categorized into a different, different uh, part. For example, politics, sports, region, and celebrity. Uh, which I have already mentioned in my chat also that I have collected 37% uh, tweets related to politics, 20% uh, related the religion, 80% uh, related celebrities and the sport. Uh, over here, I have also given some example related my uh, four different categories and I have already translated into the uh, English also, right? So there are many uh, different different hate speech over here which I have targeted. Uh, now uh, the most important thing when we are uh, just uh, I mean collect any data set, first step is to clean that data, right? So in my paper I have just mentioned everything that how I did the uh, I mean I just done the cleaning process on my data set. Right? So in the uh, pre-processing uh, task I have just uh, taken different different uh, we can see that uh, yeah, uh, different different methods like removal of URL. Initially, my data was encoded into the UTI, uh, UTF-8. It was not in, on a readable form, right? When I download the tweet from the Twitter with the help of API, right? So I just uh, convert it with the help of the Python code and I decode it into the Gujarati language. Still, my data was uh, very noisy. So after that, uh, I just uh, remove some URLs, hashtag, mentions uh, characters noise and everything with the help of python even though i have just i just remove uh, like emo uh, emojis uh, like a number stop words and then i tokenized it uh, i uh, yeah uh, after that, okay, within 2 minutes okay sir uh, after that after pre processing the task i have i just uh, anode at anoted my data set after pre-processing technique, I have a 10,000 tweets uh, and I have a 25 different users. Uh, sorry, I, I have a 25 different annotators uh, that uh, they just uh, annotate my data set. Um, for example, uh, I have considered the two factor uh, whether your uh, particular tweet is hit or not. So for that, the first factor I had considered that the target and the second factor that I considered that is the action, right? So these are the two factors which I have uh, used and I tell to that annotator that you have to consider this uh, when you just annotate the particular data set. Over here, I have targeted the different different group 
of people uh, like i uh, just uh, uh, yes i just uh, give my data set to the age age group of 41 to 49 and the different different three category uh, categories and i just create one um, uh, flow of how you can see that whether the particular uh, particular tweet is hate or not right so uh, from the beginning like uh, first of all they have to just uh, i mean cat uh, categorize into whether uh, it is politics sports religion ethnicity or not if it is there then they have to just uh, find out is there any intention or offending something or not if yes then they have to check whether there is any swearing word or not if it is there then we can consider that that is the hit page otherwise there will be uh, we have to look at for like uh, another option that is there any post which is containing any target or action if it is not then it is not hit abhilasha okay. your time is over uh, still okay. you can take 30 seconds or so more just to conclude please sure sir sure uh, so after uh, a notation of the data set as you can see that i have experiment in a different different manner over here i have just uh, removed the urls emo emojis punctuations numbers stop words and i did a tokenization also and over here uh, as you can see uh, this is the clean data and over here uh, uh, you can see that it is the unclean data uh, now i would like to conclude it uh, after this task done i just uh, i just implement the kappas uh, cohangin kappas method because of uh, after done the process of a notation a notation uh, we need to check the inter agreement between the a notator where i uh, get the score of that uh, kappas cohangin kappa that is the 0.86 which is almost perfect right so as you can see this is the uh, level of agreement of the cohangin kappa and i uh, reached to the good uh, score also uh, and this is the final data set uh, that is like 69.3 percent percentage of hate speech and 30.7 that is known head and uh, after the a notation and the pre processing i get uh, like uh, 10000 tweets okay so if you have any query anything else you can ask uh my first suggestion is that it will be good if you can increase the time period for which the data is collected uh, so that okay. is instead of just from january 20 to january 21 because you know this particular time period may see a bias in the data so just okay. to assure that the data set is generic uh, my suggestion yeah. is to increase this time period Sure. Uh, second, uh, now this is also a suggestion. Whenever using these type of words, uh, so for example, could be name of a country, could be name of a religion, could be name of a region, could be name of a caste. Just specifically make sure that no one is actually and clearly able to read it. It should not be legible. Putting just two or three asterisks will not be sufficient sure. because you know if sure. you will be submitting this paper on the international fora, so that sure. is not going to work, okay. and in fact, it can lead to objections. And okay. uh, uh, my only question after these two suggestions, my only question to you is, uh, okay, we agree that you have created a data set and that this has been done for the first time for the Gujarati language. My only question is, did you categorize this data also? I mean, instead of just uh, hate speech and non-hate speech, uh, within yes. hate speech, for example, yeah. Yes, sir. I just uh, also implement the uh, some of the machine learning algorithm, but uh, uh, my target is that uh, first of all to create a data set for that. No, my question is categorization of the data set. For example, uh, the hate speech which is targeting a particular religion, or could be a particular region, or uh, could be those which are using harsh words. Or uh, I mean, see, you have used these words interchangeably: abusive and hate and mm -hmm. violence. So you have used all of these words interchangeably. My question is, is there any subcategorization also or is it a single purpose? No, single no, sir, I, just, I have just four categories like religion where I have included the head and known head both. Okay, thank you Ablaisha for your presentation. Just take care of uh, these points. We move sure, on sir. to the next presentation.
for paper ID 296, utilization okay. of data mining classification technique to predict the food security status of wheat. Paper ID 296. Ali, are you there? Good afternoon, yes. Just a minute. Let me make it. Share, share my PowerPoint, please, Dr. Patel. Okay. Now you are the presenter, so you can share your PPT. Yeah. Okay. Share. Share my desktop. Hey, Dr. Batil. Yes. Share my desktop. No, we can't see you. See your screen. You can't? No. Yes. Yes. Okay, join. Okay, you see? No. Okay. Share. 296. 296. May I start your PPT over here? Yeah. Can I start your PPT over here? Can you give presentation from your submitted PPT? Yes, I have started. Okay, let okay. me share. But I need to share it. Share, share, share from you. Yes, just. Yeah. Can you see the PPT now? Okay, I'm. Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay. Visible? Yeah, yes. PPT is visible. Uh, perhaps Dr. Patil has okay. shared. You can proceed with your presentation, please. Okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Batel and uh, Dr. Sani, and all uh, attenders in the conference. Of course, International Conference for Soft Computing and uh, its engineering application. Uh, our research uh, title utilizes of data mining uh, classification technique to predict the food security status of wheat. Our research, the uh, researcher, uh, our teams uh, for this uh, research, uh, Prof. Uh, Mohammed Tafagi, Dean of Faculty of Computers and Information. Fayoum University in Egypt, and Dr. Mariam Hizman, Head of Export System Department in Agricultural Research Center in Egypt, and Prof. Uh, Mustafa Sabit, uh, Information, Information System Department in Fayoum University in Egypt, and Dimin Hamad Reda in Export System uh, Department in Climate Change Information Center in ARC. Okay. Uh, food security uh, now the important challenges for all countries, especially for development country to save uh, requirement from strategic groups or food and commodity. Our uh, research, sorry. Our research agenda, first introduction and then the objective and questions of research and related work work and methodology and the proposed model and the proposed framework, and then the case study of research, then the result uh, and model evaluation, then conclusions and future work. Okay, Dr. Vettel, visible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Egypt and developed by many of the developed countries suffer from the weight gap or weight insecurity. Uh, that's a very from the difference between the supply chains in the domestic mar marketing and the local uh, production of group or weight. Egypt needs uh, about uh, 2 million tons of weight for each year. Uh, the weight cultivation area in Egypt uh, uh, by feeding. Egypt cultivated, uh, cultivated 3.4 million feeding or 1.4 hectares to produce uh, 9 million tons of wheat. The cultivation area of wheat uh, was uh, 48 
percent of the group area uh, inter winter group area and the uh, equal to 20 percent of the total group area uh, in all seasons dr mohammed may i just request you to focus directly on the methodology and results please okay dr sani just uh, my presentation uh, just uh, not controlled okay first back uh, third 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 okay yeah okay. the the previous related work uh, about food security or group production or yield production uh, interested with the uh, group production according to climate change Dr. Ali, it's fine. Dr. Ali, it's fine. You come to your work, your proposed work. That's uh, this yeah. research. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Methodology. Research methodology? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we, we're interested with the food security and other. Uh, our research methodology depends on the data mining uh, classification technique uh, to predict this, uh, food security the status of weight uh, according uh, to the data mining classification technique algorithm in Wika tools that we used it uh, uh, a tool. Uh, firstly, we will first we build uh, a database uh, data set for uh, groups uh, for years uh, 2015 and the, from 2015 to 2020 uh, to predict the status of food security of weight in Egypt and other countries uh, to predict uh, the status of food security of weight in the future. Uh, we take it uh, uh, this case study to predict the status of food security uh, to support decision maker uh, with appropriate uh, or informed decision to take uh, right decision at right time to uh, close the food security gap or reduce it okay next the proposed model uh, to predict the food security status of weight or other group uh, has uh, three phases first phase uh, food balance weight data set or food balance group data set uh, to collect the data related with group production and consumption with where uh, the group production Action related with the year uh, to 2050 or 60, 70, 80, and so on, and the governorate uh, or region uh, that elevated the group and uh, the area, agriculture uh, area of group and yield and domestic production total uh, production of group and the population that that's consumption this group and the requirement of of weight. The requirement of weight equal to uh, the population and the per capita for each person or citizen. Okay, the proposed model uh, has many uh, has a, has a many assumptions uh, such as average per capita of group uh, 145.8 kilogram. The total population is equal to the real population and the tourist and the resident without small child. A climate change climate change effect is uh, decreases by uh, decreases weight production by uh, 2.3 percent until 25 according to the impact model of international food policy research institute in washington dc the third consumption uh, we use the modern agriculture method and technology uh, in irrigation such as as sprinkler and uh, pivot irrigation, uh, model fertilization or organic fertilization, and other harvest techniques to and take uh, the necessary measure and policy to to close the gap between uh, the production and consumption. Okay, next is Dr. Battle. Okay. Okay. Uh, first. Uh, 
uh, we, we build the data set. Okay, 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 here, here. First, we build the data set uh, of food, balance of weight, uh, of weight. Uh, that's collected uh, through many resources from Canvas, uh, reported, uh, uh, statistic reported, and from FAO statistic database, and from economic affairs sector in agricultural research, agricultural research institute. Uh, to build uh, the common separated uh, file format uh, that uh, explores in Wicca tools to initialize data and uh, visualize it uh, into the dimension plot to perform prediction through the food security prediction model that uh, has uh, training uh, set, uh, training uh, model that induct uh, <coughs> that has training model uh, to learn the model, how to classify uh, the status of uh, the status of uh, sufficient proof, yes or no. Okay, it's back, 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 doctor. Okay, uh, well, our data set has many attributes: uh, area, uh, yield production, population, uh, average per capita, and the prediction class, sufficient or not sufficient. Sufficient or not sufficient, that's it. That's the prediction class. Uh, the prediction class, okay, detected or indicated by- please, uh, 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 Mohammed, uh, sorry for the interruption. Please uh, conclude within a minute. Okay, the prediction classes, uh, indicated by uh, the uh, learning uh, uh, classifier uh, classifier model uh, to indicate it yes or no for the status of food uh, group. Then after this process, we visualize the result of uh, <coughs> the prediction model. The prediction model result uh, will uh, evaluate it uh, through uh, confusion matrix uh, uh, recognition function. Okay, next is Dr. Battle. Is it fine? Recognition function to determine the true positive and true negative uh, to calculate the accuracy of the prediction model and the precision and the recall and the specificity and F major for model. Uh, our model uh, accuracy is uh, 92.3 percent. Uh, Burton to predict the food security status of weight in Egypt and self sufficient in the reality was 4136%. But and compared with the, the assumption of research to reach 262%. Uh, our, com our commendation depends on the features of the data set, uh, such as area to increase area or increase uh, uh, yield or investment or integrate between them to improve the self-sufficiency ratio of weight or other the group, or decreases the population growth rate or average per capita of weight to determine the cases and scenario for food security status of weight to take the right decision or policy to improve it. In the future, we integrated, we integrate and investigate alternatives and scenario to support uh, decision makers to improve food security of weight and self-sufficiency ratio of it. Uh, we present new methodology to predict food security uh, of groups and we will work to develop it and uh, uh, investigate another alternative and scenario to increase and improve it. Uh, okay. Thank yeah, thank you, Mohammed, for your presentation. Uh, I have one suggestion. Don't say it is F major because the measure that you have used is F1 measure. So be specific when you mention it. Uh, my second suggestion is just to make sure that the training data that you are using have sufficient records for the sufficient data as well as for the insufficient case. So that is number two. And my last suggestion to you is just to be careful when you use these two terms. One is food security and the other one is food quantity. 
so for instance in your title you have written food security whereas your categorization into uh, categorization is into two categories sufficient and insufficient food security could be something which is good or bad whereas food quantity could be something which is sufficient or insufficient so you can just focus uh, on those words and accordingly rephrase thanks for your presentation we move on to the last presentation of this session for paper id 136 performance analysis of cache memory in cpu paper id 136 dr gajjar uh, good afternoon sir dawal is here dawal okay yeah dawal so we we both three authors here yeah both two authors are there myself sachin gajjar and my co-author uh, dawal shah is there dr dawal shah so dr dawal shah is going to present the work uh, sorry sorry to interrupt no problem Mohammed, can you please stop sharing your screen okay okay yes okay uh, my my screen is visible yes Okay. So, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the paper title is Performance Analysis of Cache Memory. Uh, 10 minutes. Huh? Yeah, sure, I will try. So, these are the presentation outline for that. Basically, I'm going to talk about the objective, what kind of literature we have done, what, what is a cache memory, and what kind of benchmarking model we have used to obtain the performance and what kind of specification we have used that I will be cover and finally I will discuss the result with that. So if we talk about the memory is a, is a crucial part of an, today's computer system and day by day the use of memory is going to be increased because of ultimately all the CPUs or a computer to be faster and for that the hierarchy system has been deployed. In the hierarchy system is a kind of trade off between performance and capacity as you know that if if the memory which is near to the cpu uh, would be much faster than the memory which is far from the cpu so if you put the memory near to the cpu then the access time is very less but the amount of the memory would be less otherwise all the time goes in the searching so that way trade off will come so we are going to do that analysis of that uh, memory which in hierarchy like cpu after cache memory then ram and then hard disk so we are primarily focusing on the performance of the cache memory based on the speed response time and capacity that will be there. So our main objective is to demonstrate the run uh, to run the one benchmark program on the different sets of the computer and obtain the performance in terms of computation time, data access time. And when we combine both of them, the, that will be the total time of CPU. And we are going to see that how much amount of clock cycle required to complete that particular task in different level of caches. So if we want to know the what is the what are the things has been done that these are the basic literature review where paper people had tried to focus on the principle of locality where you are uh, accessing a uh, specific location for a repeated number of time or maybe you are accessing a consecutive location. That is what we call as a principle of locality and based on that a different level has been formed. If you see the bottom side, right, top uh, bottom side of uh, the PPT, the graph is shown. So the three level of cache has been given. That is L1 cache, L2 cache, and L3 cache. When we see in terms of size, L1 will be smaller than L2 and then L3. But if we see in terms of performance, what CPU going to be see that whatever data required first, it will access this L1, then go to the L2, and then L3. Uh, this way it will operate and each of this parameter all the different authors has tried to uh, see how it performs in our particular today's work what we are trying to do that we are trying to use one established benchmark and going to run that benchmark on three different uh, four different uh, uh, computers and we are going to observe that what will be the performance uh, in that here uh, as I said that this is a vector, uh, vector triad benchmark program which is uh, shown in top right uh, right hand side here, bottom right hand side here. So that particular program we are going to run on that different configuration of the PCs and then we are going to observe these many parameters as mentioned that throughput, computa uh, computational time, total time, that is a combination of computational and data access time. So that we are going to observe in that one. So now if we see the con computer specifications are listed here, there are four computer uh, computers, their specification has been given. All of them are 
uh, running with the x86 architecture with 32 bit and 64 configuration address sizes of 36 bit that is a physical address and uh, virtual address is 48 bit so and as i said that i am going to run that uh, vector triad program which i showed in the previous slide the, on this four computers and trying to obtain the result for each case so based on that running what we have done here is the benchmark logic what we are trying to summarize in a small flow chart way so what we are doing is we are trying to run that benchmark and whatever result comes we are trying to gather those result in a csv file so then from that csv file we are going to get all the data and trying to plot the result on that but here we are trying to match that also that the a result has been completed within a stipulated of time or how many clock cycle it will take to complete the job. So based on that work, these are the some results we have obtained. First is the uh, comparison between throughput of all the four computers. So if we can see the computer four, uh, computer three is outperforming well. So what, uh, we can say that whatever data is required for that computation that has been achieved from L1 cache uh, easily. And so maximum amount of time it will spending in L1 cache and subsequently it will goes on L2 and L3. So our, all the rest of the computer, the performances are quite same. In terms of the <coughs> uh, total time, the total time computer four is taking a lot uh, longer time. The reason is the amount of memory in terms of L1 cache is higher. So if you have the higher memory, the access time would be higher. And that is also depicted in this uh, result on right hand side graph. Now, if you see the computational time to run that vector program, so all the other uh, uh, computers performing quite similar, except the computer four because it has uh, having an additional L1 uh, facility. So from result, we can clearly depict that uh, if the memory size is higher than access time, uh, if memory size is higher than access time will be higher and ultimately the CPU performance is what? One upon uh, execution time. So if your memory is higher, the execution time is going to be higher and uh, subsequently your performance is going to be low. So that is what is happening in all these uh, cases, what we have seen. By running this benchmark, we have validated if you have required the data which required to be uh, available in L1, then it will uh, computation time will be less. Otherwise, it will go to the L2, then L3. And if it is not available in all of them, it will go to the main memory that RAM and the access time would be higher. So that is how by doing this work, we are trying to validate that uh, L1 first computer will go to L1, then L2, then L3. And if it won't find out that the overall time is going to be increased for performance. So here overall we are trying uh, trying to validate the L1, L3, L, uh, L1, L2 and L3 level cache performance by doing by running this particular well established benchmark on this all different computers. Thank you. So thanks uh, specifically for winding up uh, within time. Uh, though the motivation of this research work is appreciable, my only concern is about the results that you have presented. Uh, because uh, experimenting just on four computers and four architectures, I believe that is not uh, sufficient to accept the results. So my suggestion is to just increase the types of architectures. For, for instance, you said that you have experimented with Linux and Windows. You can experiment with Mac as well. So my suggestion is to include a bit more variation so that the genericness of the results could be accepted and the robustness of this uh, research work could be accepted. Sure, uh, but in case it was a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So over to you, Dr. Yeah. Patel. Yes, Dr. Saini. Uh, do you want to uh, conclude the session? Yeah, I believe yes, we can conclude this session. OK. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saini, for uh, giving your valuable times uh, for us and uh, giving uh, valuable suggestions to the authors. Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Saini. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to share my suggestions and uh, to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Dr. Kananda, are you there? Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Yes, you are visible. Morning. 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 It's afternoon. <laughs> it's afternoon. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me introduce you, Dr. Kanada. So our next uh, this uh, invited talk speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Vesimil Inyona Kanada. He is uh, from uh, Switzerland. He is a professor uh, in engineering geomatics at the uh, University of Applied Science and Art of uh, Southern Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland. His area of research are mainly GIS embedded uh, environmental modeling, geospatial web technology, and sensor webs. I welcome you, Dr. Kanata, to ICSoftComp, and I am very sorry that last time we could not include your uh, invited talk. Yeah. Okay. So no problem. You can start your presentation. Okay. Can I share the screen? Just a minute. I Okay, now you are the presenter, so you can share your screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. OK, thank you very much. I'm going to talk uh, to present you a project that we have uh, almost uh, finished. It will finish at the end of the year. And uh, it is about uh, monitoring of uh, lake water quality. And uh, this is a very important aspect, particularly with this uh, recent uh, impact of uh, climate changes uh, and um, this is very important uh, check okay this is very important because uh, there are a number of lakes uh, in our region in between uh, switzerland and italy and they are not connected but they share some uh, uh, water quality management between two different states so it is very important that the data and processes and procedures can be shared between the two countries uh, to coordinate uh, the water quality management. So uh, the main issue is there that um, uh, this kind of uh, data are managed by scientists, biologists, and uh, they do not uh, apply uh, all the IT uh, technology that are available. So uh, we need to introduce some more technology and uh, digitalization in the terms of environmental monitoring and also in terms of data management. And uh, this is very important, as I said, because uh, there are uh, a number of issues there. Uh, generally, the traditional survey and monitoring of uh, lake uh, ecosystem is conducted by person that goes on the field, collect samples, and then they analyze in laboratories or use some sensor manually in the fields to collect data year over year, and then they estimate solutions. Um, new solution like... Sorry? Sorry, sir. You can... And there are remote sensing and the new automatic high frequency monitoring systems that are now approaching and can be used. These are two examples of solutions. The one on the left is a solution that has been implemented on the Lake of Ginevra. This is a very high uh, tech uh, system with uh, a lot of sensor, and this is very ex expensive, something like, uh, I think, n not less than 2 million francs or US dollars. And uh, on the right side, there is a, a smaller solution that uh, uses a buoy, a chain of sensor uh, located in place, and uh, this is also, anyway, a cost, uh, an expensive solution. And uh, the other thing is that this kind of data are still, uh, even uh, those uh, we are in 2022, managed by Excel file, text file, or uh, database file. 
and there is lack of uh, uniformity in the format of the data, in ontology, interoperability. In this is, of course, a prone uh, error process. They have several copies of the same data in different locations. There is no data integrity, and there is a data latency between the collection information and uh, and uh, their exploitation. So there is really a, a huge gap to be filled in this uh, data. So we propose an interoperability standard so with metadata schema and fire principle to fill in this gap. And uh, it's not only a technological issues, but there are also resistance to change, as you know, in uh, adopting digital solution, uh, lack uh, of easy to play solution and that interoperability between systems, which are mainly proprietary by the sensor things. And of course, there is cost, because if you need to replicate this anywhere, uh, you need to find a reasonable solution. So water ecosystem can benefit. These are the quests. Uh, the question of research, how can we integrate and fill in this gap to help in tracking. So the solution uh, is uh, based on uh, using some open source standard uh, software that integrates all the process flow of the data from the field collection to the processing, uh, the organization, and then the, the services with standards. The approach is experimental testing and goes from the case study and uh, developing a system, testing, deploying, and making analysis and evaluation. Uh, we implement a two-tier data solution. So we have uh, one uh, uh, database instance with this uh, ESOS uh, software, which is a software that implements a sensor observation service, which is international standard for data from sensor. And uh, we have deployed this uh, on uh, a, a platform uh, on the lake. So locally on a Raspberry Pi, we have installed the, all, all the system with the database that collect information and perform the first data quality analysis and then transmit the data to the uh, central unit uh, in our data hub uh, that perform them all uh, the other aspects of the research. We have implemented some specific uh, dashboard uh, for, um, to manage the activities, register the sensor, uh, uh, we uniform and create ontologies for uh, the observed properties that are on the fields uh, and the unit of measurements. Uh, and uh, we populate data with uh, a number of years. Some of these data have more than 40 years of data. Some are more recent. The one in the, in the block are recent one from uh, field survey. Then we implemented also some uh, dashboard for uh, data analysis and visualization so that biologists can observe the, da the lake water profile of different uh, observed properties and perform their own analysis. Uh, they can see it also as a time series uh, and perform their own analysis. Then we implemented also some uh, uh, analysis uh, with asynchronous processes automatically uh, based uh, on a scheduled time, uh, based on uh, event uh, uh, approach. And uh, different type of uh, specific algorithms has been implemented to automatically process data that comes from the sense. This is the solution, uh, the chip solution that we have implemented for on the lake uh, based on Raspberry Pi and only on open uh, source and open hardware solution. And uh, of course, there is a, a lot of issues, uh, uh, issue, a lot of uh, duties in maintaining the system and uh, in maintaining the quality of the data that we have collected. Uh, I'm coming close to the end, showing that then this data can be analyzed in real time to evaluate lake metabolism. Lake metabolism is a major indicator for lake to indicate uh, the quality of the ecosystem, the capacity of the system to reproduce and maintain uh, life in the water. And uh, general disease uh, calculated uh, using uh, a very complicated uh, approach uh, based on laboratory analysis. With this solution, now we can calculate the same indicator in real time with data that comes uh, every minute. So this is a huge ch change in uh, the evaluation and the data in ecosystem, lake ecosystem management. And um, this is the algorithm that implements several equations. I don't go into detail. These are preliminary results on the analysis of the data of quality that we collected from our stations. 
and these are some uh, indication on um, the power consumptions uh, and uh, data collected. Uh, here we can see that we have uh, high frequency data that permit uh, to fill the gap. Uh, consider that uh, before this system you have one uh, data collection every two weeks. Uh, here you have one data every minute collected. So you can really analyze and understand how the processes are going in between uh, the two weeks uh, sampling time that was done before. And this uh, really allow to act uh, in time and predict, uh, make prediction. Of course, this will enable a number of uh, application that uh, will uh, span all around uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for better improved uh, things. These are, at the end, the calculation of this uh, primary production. In green, you see the respiration of the algae, and in blue is the gross, and in orange, the net primary production. This primary production is indication also of algal bloom that can be also of cyanobacteria, which is a particular species of algae which is toxic also for human people. So this will prevent and enable some real water management system and prevent uh, uh, problem uh, rising uh, issues. And uh, the system cost uh, was about 15,000, but 15,000 was uh, mostly the cost of the platform, which is 10,000 at least. Uh, and uh, the next step is uh, to try to miniaturize the system and make it uh, cheaper. And uh, of course, uh, all these uh, information are open and uh, replicable. And that's all. And as a conclusion, the idea is that we have uh, digitalized a process uh, in a field of science that was really manual and uh, didn't uh, take advantage of the digital transformation. And we transform it uh, to a more uh, uh, digitalized process that enable a lot of uh, further uh, uh, possibilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanata. Any question from the audience? Participant? Mm -hmm. Any query or any? Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Hello, Maxi, sir. This is Sandeep. We met in 2017 in Phosphorji, Asia, Hyderabad. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. How are you, sir? <laughs> Very good. I'm good. And you? Yeah, I'm also fine, sir. Sir, it is very nice presentation. Thank you. Any question from audience? Sir, is, is this system able to detect the uh, the dangerous metal uh, in the in the water? Because the, the, the severe, severe water or the lake that is near to the industrial area and uh, there are so many toxic metals uh, the bare part in the it is dissolved in the water it does not dissolve but it causes to the cancer so yeah this is basically i think uh, system you are to detect the metal elements it's okay uh, let's say that uh, we try to develop a system that can be then uh, uh, further deployed and uh, enlarged. So the system as it has been built is open, can be replicated, and you can add whatever kind of sensor that you need. So at the time of uh, today, we have uh, mainly a sensor that uh, observe uh, uh, physical parameters, not chemical, uh, not so many sensor for chemical parameters, but uh, uh, you can add uh, your own sensor because uh, the the system has been developed so that uh, the communication system use only standards uh, and open system. So if you find a, a sensor that detects arsenic, for example, and they exist, you can plug in in the system and then automatically collect all the data and make them available. Thank you, That's great, sir. Thank any you. Other, any other participant? Any question? So I think no question, Dr. Kanata. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanata, for sparing your valuable time for us. 
and giving a very good uh, uh, talk here. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanada. Thanks to all of you for the opportunity. Thank you. So, our next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Rasmi Saini. Uh, she is from uh, Govind uh, Vallabh Pant Institute of Engineering and Technology. Her uh, area of research uh, uh, is uh, machine learning for remote sensing and GIS application. So I welcome uh, Dr. Saini. Are you there? Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Let me make you presenter. Yeah, sure. Yes, you can share your screen. Yeah, is it visible, sir? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is visible. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Turn to and, the presentation. Uh, pardon? Come to the presentation mode. So the topic for the talk is machine learning for the satellite image processing, or you can say in the domain of remote sensing. So we are going to discuss regarding few contents in the today's talk that for the audience who are completely unaware with the concept of remote sensing, what is basically it? What is the fundamental concept behind the remote sensing? Then we are going to discuss the type of remote sensing and the resolution is one of the very important parameter in the domain of remote sensing. Then the machine learning and types of learning and the most importantly, how we can integrate the machine learning application in the domain of remote sensing. Then we are going to discuss a little bit regarding one classification that we have produced by our student. So if I talk about the remote sensing, it is a, you can say the science or art by which we can acquire the information about any you can say the object or the phenomena or any, it may be the ocean, it may be the glacier, it may be a particular building or anything, any, any object you can say. And I'm obtaining the information about this particular object by using some sort of technology, some set of uh, modeling, some set of uh, techniques. So we can say, and then we are going to processing, analyzing and applying that information. So the science of acquiring the information about the earth surface using the instrument, which are remote to the earth surface, usually the aircraft or the satellite, and the instrument may use the visible light, infrared or the radar in order to obtain the data. So if we uh, discuss it, it include basically uh, several steps. The first one is the like energy source or the illumination. The first requirement for the remote sensing that we have to the energy source in order to illuminate the target of interest and the radiance and the atmosphere as the energy travel from the source to the target, it came into the contact and uh, interact with the atmosphere it passes through. So the interaction may place and the second time the energy travel from target to the sensor. So thereafter, the third step is the interaction with the target. Whenever the energy came to the object, it interact with the object and capture the property of the object and the energy uh, like uh, uh, convert based on the properties of the objects. And that's why we process this information and extract some useful uh, information about the object. So recording the energy by the sensor, thereafter the energy has been scattered by or emitted by the target, we require the sensor to collect the record in the electromagnetic radiation. Thereafter the transmission, reception as well as processing. 
and interpretation and analysis this is a very important step where the role of the analyst or we can say the scientist or the researcher came into the existence where most of the people work on the this particular step we call the interpretation and the analysis now you are having the input data you are having the techniques now uh, what is your object in order to obtain the information? One person may uh, focus on the, as, as the previous speaker already uh, talked about, the water quality analysis or the glacier snow melt analysis or for the uh, crop analysis, crop monitoring, crop mapping. There are the multiple applications, uh, building uh, detection and many more. And application as we have discussed, different kind of application. So this is a single screen where you can see the all of the information. The first step is the data acquisition that include the pre-processing and here we get the our final data on which we are going to work. Then we are having the pre-processing and the analysis. So some people work for the pre-processing of the data in order to, like you can see, the data uh, we are going to prepare for the uh, final analysis. So the noise removal, any kind of the atmospheric correction or any kind of the error removal, we can say, we can just roughly say uh, regarding the step two. Then the step three, that image processing and analysis, here, uh, we can say either you can go for the any kind of the uh, conventional method for the classification, or you can go for the machine learning technique or in advance ensemble learning techniques or the deep learning techniques, you can apply for your own application to obtain the desired result. So the type of learning, we can say the passive remote sensing as well as the active remote sensing. Here, the remote sensing of the energy is naturally reflected or radiated from the terrain, whereas the active remote sensing, the remote sensing method that provide their own source of electromagnetic radiation to eliminate the terrain, we can see in the figure. So this is a, uh, basically the electromagnetic wave spectrum where we are going to capture the information in terms of the, we can say the bats, okay? So when we talk about the multispectral data that signify uh, that we are going to capture the data corresponding to different wavelength range. Uh, for example, the uh, red, green, blue, NIR, and, and uh, many more uh, bands are possible like microwave, radio wave, many more uh, bands are possible in order to capture the data. So the reflectance of the <coughs> to the digital number. So this particular uh, figure represent that this is our data, how we capture it. And this is a little bit of the zoomed information and how we are going to process the information. Look, when we capture the image, we are not going to capture the image we are not going to process this particular image we are going to process the information corresponding to each and every pixel that the image formed right so if we are talking about the single band image that means we are having the single set of data corresponding to each and every pixel that constitute that particular image right whereas when we talk about the multispectral image for example i am having the 10 band so i have to process the information regarding the 10 band so as I already said, this is the structure of the remote sensing data. Here we are having the multiple bands as we call it the multi-spectral data. And the band information, you can see the first point represent the first pixel. And if we are having seven band, then we are having the seven different information regarding the first pixel. So this is very important to understand when we are going to pursue the research in the domain. So this is one, uh, there are the uh, different option you available uh, that you are going to uh, work uh, in the domain of remote sensing. You can go for the paid data, that is the very high resolution data, and you can also avail the freely available data, and uh, that is the medium res resolution data is usually freely available. So this is an Indian, uh, Indian satellite that provide data, freely available and the resolution <coughs> is as mentioned in the figure. 
So the resolution is one very important parameter when you are going to consider uh, and you are uh, going to consider a specific application to work with. So the spatial resolution, we can see the Landsat data is a medium spatial resolution data, whereas on the right hand side, the image is the quick bird imagery that is having the very high resolution data. It is the 0.67 meter. So the image clarity itself represents like, like the how good resolution it is. Uh, usually when we are going to uh, when we are going for the application uh, that require the specific object then usually we go for the higher resolution data whereas the uh, the medium special or we can say the built up extraction or we can say the crop monitoring crop mapping crop classification and many more so the spectral resolution basically represent the number of bands you are going to consider and the temporal resolution uh, in a simple word represent the frequency of uh, the data capturing. For example, uh, the satellite capture the data after every 20 days. So we will say the temporal resolution is that particular span of time. And in order to uh, uh, consider the temporal resolution, we have to understand we uh, like uh, for few application, we require the good temporal resolution. Radiometric resolution as uh, we, uh, the people belongs to the computer science may uh, understand like when we require one one pixel information in order to represent it in the, in the system in the computer. So we say that 8 bit is going to represent the DN value and here for 16 bit is going to represent the DN value. So every satellite have the different radiometric resolution. So visual uh, interpretation or the band combination, this particular uh, figure is re represented where we can, uh, the same figure is here, the same image is here, where the representation by the color composite is different. So we can understand, this is basically for the visual interpretation. Here, the uh, forest area is highlighted in the right hand side imagery. This is the one of the most commonly used visual interpretation. We call it the false color composite. And for the same imagery, we have shown the false color composite. Okay, this is a very good imagery in order to understand the people who are uh, who wish to work in this and do not have any idea about it. So this is an imagery where the two different kind of water bodies is available there. One is having the turbid water and another one is having the clear water. So by just sitting here and capturing the information by using the satellite, some sort of analysis and classification and processing, I'm able to detect that which water body having the clear water and which is having the turbid water. So this is the beauty of the remote sensing uh, when it is integrated with the advanced techniques. So machine learning, as we already said, it's a, uh, we can say the very domain to work. And when it is integrated with the remote sensing, you can achieve very good result as compared to the traditional method. So learning uh, by the Tom Michel, we can say the machine learning is the study of algorithm that improve the performance of some task T by by uh, with experience E. So in order to understand, we just say that we are going to work uh, in order to achieve some task and we are training our model with some example and then we are going to perform some testing in order to evaluate whether it worked or not. So this is a classic example that, uh, that used to understand the importance of the machine learning. Here we can say that is formed by different uh, different person or the different uh, examples are there. Whereas when we train our model, then it will be easy if if uh, we train the model by using various kind of the examples, so that the model capability will improve in order to detect when we go for the actual implementation or for the testing. Excuse me. 
this is another good example for the machine learning where we are having the autonomous car. So the machine learning do not work as simple as it appears. It requires millions of examples in order to train the model or to train the machine to work such a for such an application like a driverless car. So when we are having a driver, driver use their own intelligence in order to control the situation or to avoid the accident. Whereas when we are completely dependent on machine, you can understand how much uh, difficult it would be to train a model for a such real world scenario. So it required a huge example to uh, make the system understand and to work and to able to work. It's still. So we can say the domain of the machine learning have so uh, like different area in order to work, you can go for the recognizing pattern. There are the several, again, different subdomain, medical imaging, healthcare, gener generating patterns, recognizing anomalies, prediction for the future stock prices, and many more. And one big domain is the remote sensing. Whereas if I talk about the remote sensing specifically, there are the multiple uh, application when you are going to do, as we already discussed. So the three time kind of learning, you can go for the supervised learning, unsupervised learning and the semi-supervised learning. Where the supervised, <coughs> when you are having a good set of training data the, with the label and the unsupervised, when you are you are, do not have the labeled data, desired label, then you can choose the unsupervised. And the third one is quite suitable when you are having the few training data. Okay, uh, so this is our one classification problem when uh, this is basically for the supervised method that we have formed during our work. So we are having the labeled set of data. We are having the training the ML model that is the machine learning model and machine learning model you may choose based on your work. And then we are going to optimization. Optimization is very, very important. Optimization basically represent that you are going to uh, choose the parameter that is, uh, that is going to produce the best result for this particular application. Then when we train the model, then, then we test the model and the predict the outcome or uh, produce the result in terms of the classification that will give you the maps as well as the statistical data. So there are the multiple uh, uh, multiple uh, <coughs> choices for the machine learning technique. For example, ANN, Navebase, k nearest neighbor, support vector machine, boosting technique, distant tree, random forest, rotation forest, and many more. Boosting, gradient boosting, and many more techniques. So this is our work we have, when we have uh, performed, we have used the random forest algorithm and this is the final outcome. Uh, as the time was limited, so we cannot uh, uh, go through the whole processing. It is a uh, lengthy process. We have implemented this uh, by using the R programming language. And here the result represent basically the land use land cover map and we have classified the few categories as mentioned in the literature. This is the multispectral imagery. This is the snapshot of our work when we work uh, during the R programming. And this is for the single display, whereas the previous one for the uh, display of the information when we are having the four band, right? And when we are having the single band. And this is the false color composite of the same imagery as I have told you that we can view the information in the false color composite. The information is more clearly visible. This is the NDVI calculation. Uh, NDVI is an indices, so that is the normalized difference vegetation indices. There is a specific formula for this, and we uh, calculate this formula by using the uh, uh, input bands that we are having. And uh, this is the uh, NDVI. People can uh, see there are the various work for the land use land cover classification. You can, this is the work for the land set data, whereas the previous one was the, uh, uh, it was for the Sentinel data. And this is the land cover classification from another satellite. You can see this is the land use land cover map you can produce and 
the one application the people may choose the monitoring and deforestation process and this is basically the time series data where the people choose the different time scale classify their result and uh, evaluate on the basis of time scale for one we choose the time gap of 5 year or 10 year based on the application and the beauty of the remote sensing um, with advanced technique is this is one uh, one slide that we can see this is one uh, research work performed by goma and it is uh, we have taken from the literature so it is a distribution of rice in asia and we can see that in a single slide we can just get an idea of our country india that where the rice distribution is higher as compared to the other area so this is the beauty of remote sensing so people may work in this where by using the advanced technique machine learning or either by using the deep learning so thank you so very much and this is my mail id and uh, if uh, you have any question you may reach from participant if you have any question or query you may ask <coughs> anyone <coughs> audience hello yes i'm audible yes you are audible so i have a question what are the yeah. <coughs> what are the other indices available for the uh, for the free cover identification from the land is land cover apart from ndbi there are the many indices you will find out there are the many indices you can go if you are going to consider the radage right for the sentinel 2 you are having the radage based indices you can have the ndvi mnd vi gndvi there are the multiple variation you can find out the uh, NDWI that is specifically for water. Some are specifically for built-up extraction. So you can find out there are the multiple indices, not only the NDVI. And if and uh, uh, the indices you can choose based on your application. As I already said, for example, you are going to consider the vegetation monitoring. As I consider the vegetation monitoring, right? So we have considered the radage band as well as the uh, indices that include the radage based NDVI. We call it the radage NDVI indices that include the three band of uh, uh, radage one, radage two, radage three. of uh, the sentinel 2 satellite and on that basis these these are the three uh, different uh, indices that we have used in our study also yeah yeah hello anyone else yes so, have yes pardon little bit fast someone yeah yeah ah uh, yes i have got a question Yeah, I'm not getting. Please. Uh... Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Can you explain uh, or uh, in a brief uh, how machine learning is working in remote sensing? Ah, uh, okay. Which technique you have applied? Okay. Okay. Uh, actually this is a like you can say the large question uh, one may require uh, at least one hour uh, session in order to uh, like explain everything okay but in a very brief manner i will say i have considered the support vector machine classifier remote sensing classifier uh, boosting algorithm and i have also considered the uh, knn classifier as well so i have considered several uh, classifier then i have tested these classifier then i have chosen which classifier is giving the good result for my own application right and then uh, i have selected classifier and then further i have uh, used these classifier for my next study okay so how it work as we go for the next question how it work what we have to do uh, as we know that uh, machine learning is a concept that work on a itself learning right 
So we say the term learning, either it is writing the digital number two, or as I already explained, or whether I have to tell the machine like this is a building, right? Or this is a water, or this is a tree, or this is a grass. So what I have to do, I have to tell the machine like these are the sample and these are their labels. Okay, so when we talk about the label, I say this is my input data and this is the corresponding level. This is my input data. This is the corresponding level. So what I do, I have uh, I have collected the sample through the field visit by having the label and then I have trained my machine machine learning algorithm for this particular label data set of label data and then after the training of the model, we have applied for the testing purpose and then obtain the final classification result. Yeah. So, so yeah. Any other question? Yes, yes, yes please, please, please. Yeah, please. So uh, in this research, you have applied a support vector machine, SVM. Yes, I think. yes, yes. OK, yes. The, as you know, so many so many techniques are available, just like uh, random forest uh, trees and so many uh, techniques are there. So why you are not using the clustering technique? Clustering? Clustering is basically used uh, when you do not go, when you do not have any idea about your input data. Okay. For example, clustering is basically useful when you do not have the, any idea about the classes. You take some uh, satellite imagery of an unknown place, right? You do not have any idea about it. That means you do not have the labeled data about that particular area. Then you go for the clustering. Whereas in my case, the clustering is not uh, like the useful option. Oh. Oh. Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Okay. Uh, Dr. Saini, thank you very much for uh, sparing fuel time for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity to, uh, for inviting me. Thank you so very much for all the audience. Thank you. So we have a next uh, technical session as for. Uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Aditya Sastri and Dr. Gabriel Oliveira as session chair. Just give me. Dr. Sastri, are you there? Yes, sir, I am here. Just. And Dr. Oliveira? I am here, Professor. Okay, just a minute. Dr. Oliveira, are you there? Yes, I listen. Okay, both of you are uh, now the Dr. Sastri, just a minute. I have joined uh, with the ID that you have sent. I see softcom 353. Three, five, three. Still one. Uh, Okay, so I welcome you both uh, Dr. Oliveira and Dr. Sastri for this session, uh, session as four. In this session, we have uh, six paper, author of uh, six paper are going to present their papers. And uh, each author will get uh, 10 minutes to present their paper. And uh, after that, uh, we have 
four to five minutes of question answer session. So I hand over this uh, session to you, both of you. Do you have the schedule, Dr. Sastri? Yes. Yes, sir. I have the schedule, but in my schedule, I can see only five papers. Uh, the sixth one is, I think. Uh, two, six, five. Okay. First one is one, nine, zero. One, nine, zero, two, ninety, four, eighty, eight, one, one, nine, and two hundred and sixty, seven. Okay. Last one is two, sixty, five. That uh, okay. two, sixty, five. Okay. Fine. I have made. So, author of uh, one, nine, zero, are you there? Author of paper, I think one, nine, zero. Yes, I think the author is. Uh, Rohit, thank you. Rohit, are you there? He's not here. He's not here. So any, we can start with next. From um, paper ID 190, are you there? Anyone is there? So, so let me start with next paper, Professor. 294 is like absent. Again, and uh, we have paper ID double A. Yes, sir, I'm here, Raju. Raju, okay, just me. Let me make you presenter. Okay, sir. Okay, now you're present, so you can start your presentation and you can share that PPT. Okay, your sir. Minutes to complete the presentation. Sure, sir. Sir, please confirm is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Thank yes, you. It is visible. Thank you. Good evening, sir. I am Raju Gurla, PhD scholar under the guidance of Dr. Satyanarayana Vallala and Dr. Rohul Amin from Tribulation Higher Airport, Chhattisgarh. Uh, today, I would like to present a topic on reliable nickel packet binary classification against to paper ID 088. Uh, with the help of this content, I would like to proceed. Introduction to network topic classification, literature survey, network packet binary classification, implementation, results analysis, Conclusion and future risk, and lastly, the references. So, a small introduction to the network topic classification. Actually, the network topic classification is the process of categorizing the network topic according to various parameters into a number of topic classes. Actually, the main purpose of network topic classification is to assure quality of service, quality of engineering, network management, and also ensure efficient bandwidth utilization in a network, etc. But the network traffic classification can be performed based on these three ways, uh, like port number based techniques and payload based techniques are uh, deep packet inspection and statistical and machine learning based techniques. But nowadays, uh, it is not possible to adapt the first two types of categories as why because uh, nowadays P2 peer applications and uses the dynamic port numbers and uses the user defined protocols. And also regarding the second DPA, uh, according to according to the Google Transparency Report, uh, as of November 2020, 22, uh, 95% of the internet traffic uses the encrypted traffic. So these two approaches are not possible to perform the network traffic classification. So the best fit for the network traffic classification is only the statistical and machine learning based techniques. So we focused on the third one. So coming to the literature survey uh, based on this topic, uh, most of the existing works are focused on the uh, improvement of the accurate uh, rather than the classification time. Why? Because and now we, this, we are working with the communications to be, be get faster. So accuracy, obviously, we will get the uh, more accuracy till 94 on average 95 percentage. But we need to focus on the get the information faster to the destination. On a, uh, like a real time information. So, uh, coming to the few literature survey focused on uh, as follows. Uh, first work is from Ka Fran Casino et al. Actually, they performed classification of encrypted and compressed packets and they used one technique called Hedge, high entropy distinguisher. 
actually they got the results uh, accuracy results for the 68 percentage and 94 percentage for 1 kb and 64 kb packets and coming to the second work uh, parameter at all they worked on only vyp packet classification actually they used one statistical uh, tests like NIST and the entropy tests and a codex and they achieved accuracy of 83 and 99 percentage for different codec VOIP traffic classifications. And also in the work of um, Fabio D. Gasperi et al. They performed the classification of encrypted and compressed file fragments and they used one technique called ENCODE that stands for Encryption Compression Distinguisher. It is a learning based classifier and actually they achieved accuracy of 86 percentage for 512 KB packets and 94 percentage for compressed data. Actually they used a large data set so it is not possible to apply for online traffic classification. And in the last work of Bembo Zing et al. They performed encrypted traffic classification and its state technique is flow based to real relation network. Actually, they learned from a raw data from the online network and they used a one technique called hallucinator for the data set balancing and they achieved 82 uh, percentage for the classification and they also uh, combined training and classification phases into a single phase. So out of this uh, literature survey, we understood that most of the works are focusing on the accuracy improvement uh, than the uh, classification time reduction. So we to fill up this gap, we focused on the uh, classification time as a parameter besides accuracy improvement. So for that one, we developed one technique called network packet binary classification. The steps or uh, the process for this approach is as follows in this one identification of compressed and encrypted packets from the network traffic is accomplished in this one the features are extracted from each packet are used and even also for feature selection methods a principal component analysis and auto encoder are, are used for efficient classification of, of data packets and finally classification timing is reduced with the help of efficient feature selection methods architecture actually our data set uh, is transferred from one system to the another system in a local area network uh, at the destination system we captured the uh, incoming traffic as a packet capture files and from that packet capture files we extracted the uh, in, we extracted the features from each and every packet and finally we will have a set of features in the form of a csv comma separated files and for that uh, file, we performed the normalization, data cleaning, and the data set balancing also. So finally, we will get the uh, data set with labeled, uh, unlabeled information. So based on then the traffic we transferred from source to the destination, we added the labels for each and every packet. So finally, we have the a complete data set, and this data set is given to the set of classifiers through a dimensionality reduction techniques. We use two mainly dimensionality reduction techniques are used, principal component analysis and the auto encoder. And to mm, check the accuracy of the, the PC and auto encoder, we used uh, without uh, feature selection also, we performed the classification. Finally, we will get the <coughs> accuracy results for in three ways. Uh, here we used SVM decision tree, random forest, logistic regression, and KNN as a classifiers to perform these techniques. So uh, in the subsequent slides, uh, I will discuss the results. Coming to the data set overview, our data set mainly consists of two types of files, compressed files and encrypted files. And again, in turn, each category of files consists of binary files, image files, mp3 files, pdf files, text and video files also. And again, each and every type of files consists of five different sizes of packet sizes from 64 KB to 1024 KB. We use this data set. And coming to the uh, number of files in each data set, 
Actually, in our data set, we have consists of two types of classes, encrypted and compressed to packets. As we mentioned in our title, it is a binary classification uh, in each and every data. So to maintain the balance among the information which we are using in our data set, we are using different number of files for different number of packets, like for 64 KB packets, we are using 1600. For 128 KB packets, we are using 800 packets only. Like that, we balanced the information among our data set. So these are the results. Uh, actually, this particular chart represents the classification accuracy without feature selection. All the features are given to the classifiers, and we will get these results for all classifiers. Uh, in this one, the SVM achieved a very low class accuracy, like 65% per in 64 KB packets. And in the KNN and decision tree, we achieved 83% as maximum in 128 KB packets. Going to the classification accuracy with the help of principal component analysis, we achieved a very low 67 percentage in the in logistic regression in 128 KB packet and a decision tree adds 100 percentage in 512 KB packets. <coughs> uh, this chart represents the classification accuracy by using R2 encoder. Here, a uh, logistic regression adds only 68 percentage in 64 KB packets and a decision tree adds 100 percentage as like before in 512 KB packets. So uh, as was I mentioned, uh, apart from the, the classification accuracy, we also focused on the classification to, to be a, which uh, used for the, the, of our models. Here this table represents a different classification time in seconds used for uh, perform classification by using different uh, classifiers in three ways without feature selection with PCA and with auto encoder and the packet sizes are 64 to 512 KB packets. Actually here we are not used uh, 1024 so KB. Sorry, sir? For you. Please yes, continue sir? paper in two minutes. Sure, sure sir, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> here SVM classifies 64 KB packets in 16.127 seconds without feature selection and decision tick classifies 512 KB packets with PCA or auto encoder in 0 0.009 seconds only. Here uh, out of uh, two um, auto encoder is outperforms in classification time in most of the cases. Coming to the conclusion that traffic classification is an essential requirement in network security and management. So most of the classification models focus on accuracy than the optimized resource utilization like classification time. So network packet binary classification, our proposed approach with optimized resource utilization is achieved. So coming to the future work, uh, we would like to work on VPN and non-VPN traffic characterization and application identification with improved accuracy. And also besides, uh, I would like, we would like to work on online encrypted traffic identification also. So I refer to these references for our work. Thank you. Sir, can I stop sharing, sir? Yes. Anyone has any question or query? Dr. Sastri or Dr. Kara? Uh, yes, uh, Raju, I do have a question. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what, how exactly your data looks. I mean, the structure or the format of your data set. Uh, our format in the form of numbers, sir, uh, in this form of CSV files. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and all the all the fields means all the parameters are having a numerical values only. Yes, sir. Definitely. Yes. Okay, and second question related to classifiers. Why you sir. have selected only those classifiers which you mentioned? Uh, is there yes, any sir. specific reason for that or it is just a trial and error? No, sir. Actually, uh, we referred uh, many around eight classifiers we used uh, to perform all this information. But out of that eight, we have got the good accuracy uh, in terms of classification accuracy and classification time also for these four only. 
sorry, five. That's why we chosen these five classifiers. Okay, thank you. Thank Any you. Other? It's fine from my side. Firstly, congratulations for excellent presentations. I have one question. My okay. question is is reference in, in your uh, figure number six. I don't understand. Uh, could you please could you explain it the the better this figure, please? Sure, sir. Uh, which one, sir? Slide number six. Sir? Yes, yes. yes, I am sharing again. So this one. Yes. So actually uh, in our proposed approach, uh, these are the steps or our process for our proposed approach. First, we need to perform identification of complex and encrypted packets from network traffic. We need to take the traffic from the network, like um, a network uh, from source to the destination, and we need to collect the information at the destination set, and we need to extract the information from that traffic, and based on the, the two extracted features, we need to apply the classifiers, and also we need to divide whether that traffic is encrypted or not. So oh, in the traditional works, they used this approach, but to get the more re results very quickly or uh, faster, we used oh, these two dimensionality reduction techniques like principal component analysis and auto encoder. Okay. okay. So with the help of these two oh, techniques, our classification time is reduced compared to other, other works. Okay, Raju. I understand. Yes, sir. Sorry. You, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I understand that moment. And yes. I know. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your results. Thank so you. Next, sir. Paper, next paper is uh, uh, with paper ID 119. So, yes, is sir. Are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my number is 47. 47. Yes, now you are a presenter, so you can share your presentation. Yeah. Uh, may I know whether my screen is visible or not? Yes, it is visible. Yeah, thank you. I, hi everyone, a very warm good afternoon to one and all. I'm Akita Babu, a former student of Central University of Rajasthan, currently working as a big data engineer at Tata Consultant Services. On behalf of my co-authors, Mr. Bharat Chaudhary and Dr. Basna Talibda, I'm here to present our paper, an ensemble multi-label classifier for intracranial hemorrhage reduction from large, heterogeneous and imbalanced database. Before moving into the details of the paper, let me give a brief introduction. Uh, what is this about and how is it important to us? Intracranial hemorrhage or intracranial bleed, which is abbreviated as ICH in the paper, is basically any bleeding from the blood vessel within the skull vault. Uh, this is a serious medical emergency condition because the building up of blood within the skull can lead to increase in the intracranial pressure, which can crush delicate uh, blood tissue or limit its blood supply, which often leads to death. According to the studies, it has been noticed that approximately half of the mortality occurs within the first 24 hours, highlighting the critical importance of early and effective treatment of the same. The most rapid and readily available tool for the diagnosis of ICH is computerized tomography, we call a CT scan, especially a non contrast CT, that is, which is oftenly the first diagnostic modality used most commonly in the emergency department. So here, the radiologist and the medical professionals have to analyze huge chunks of 
medical images, which is a time consuming process. Time is a matter of grave concern for medical diagnosis and early detection of location and type of any hemorrhage. Our paper proposes a hybrid convolutional neural network with SVM and XC-Boost classifier for detection and classification of hemorrhages if exist. Now about the data set we have used. The brain CT data set collected by the Radiological Society of North America in collaboration with members of American Society of Neuroradiology and MD.AI is used for the study. This is one of the largest public data set that is comprised of an uh, compressed of an ordered uh, non contrast cranial CT exams. It consists of a set of image IDs and multi labels indicating the presence and absence of the hemorrhage. If present, uh, its type like we have subarachnoid, intraventricular, all these are depending on its location, uh, shape, and proximity to the other structures. So this is a multi-level classification data set with highly imbalanced distribution of the classes. So here in this image, uh, we can see that there is a different type of classification and epidural, which is having the least uh, representation among all and subdural having the most representation. Now moving forward, let's look into the steps we have used in the proposed ensemble multi-label classifier for intracranial hemorrhage detection. In the first phase, uh, the CT scans were pre-processed before feeding into the model. Uh, the scans that are stored in the form of DICOM files were reconstructed to form input for our model. In order to extract the grayscale component of the image, that's mainly uh, we have two components, windowing length and windowing width is used uh, to focus a particular uh, section of the CT scan. Uh, using different level of window width and level, we extracted the brain, uh, subdural and bone. This is uh, later followed by a resampling technique to get a little more spatial resolution from adjacent slices, which kept the pixel spacing consistent, else it may be hard for the model to generalize. Then the images were cropped to focus on the informative part. Later, the three windows were concatenated to form RGB files as input for the proposed model. Now uh, we have handled the imbalance data set also. So from the previous graph, it was very crystal clear that some type of the hemorrhage was more common than the others. So this may lead to overlearn of the majority class creating a model bias. To minimize this, we have used three different methods. First one is called the weighted, uh, weighted class approach. So in this approach, it assigns individual weight for each class instead of a single weight. Since class weighting adds up to fine-tuned decision threshold, it has been observed to be useful for estimating the class probabilities. The second method we have used is undersampling technique. A simple undersampling technique is used to include all the samples from the minority class, selecting randomly twice the number of the sampling from the majority class. The third step we have used is data augmentation. Using this method, we could add additional data points to the minority class by applying different transformation methods without altering data class labels. Now, the modeling framework solution that we have proposed, we have termed it excess DNN. Uh, over time, you'll understand why we have termed it like that. Here, we use a deep learning architecture, ResNet50, and train it to our RGB format input. Then we use a global pooling step, which gives a feature vector. This output is individually trained on SVM, XCBoost, and CNN architecture. That's why the name is called XSDNN, where S is, uh, indicates SVM, X indicates XCBoost, and DNN just indicates that it's a deep neural network. Post this step, we concatenate the average prediction of these three models, which will be the outcome probability of this model used for the prediction of the existence of the hemorrhage and its type, if any. So this paper actually aims to explore the advantages of deep neural network along with XCBoost and SVM. So the same we have depicted here. First, we have the CNN architecture. Then we have led it to do a, put into a global average pooling. This embedded into an SVM and XCBoost and these uh, and a CNN architecture. These three are individually trained and the output of the three. We took the uh, take the average of the three and that is the final outcome. 
uh, the steps involved in the design from the beginning we have uh, depicted in a graphical image where the data is pre-processed from then here the diacom formatted files are pre-processed and converted into RGB using uh, different pre-processing methods like a windowing function data augmentation. And also we have handled the imbalanced data set here. And then the model is trained over ResNet 50 uh, and over an average uh, global average pooling. And this embedded, uh, we get a feature vector. And this is pooled into a XE boost and SVM CNN architecture separately and trained separately to get the prediction. So the average of all is taken. The same we have done uh, uh, pictorial representation of sync, the diacom, which is a CT images pre-processed, put into a CNN architecture, then feature vector. This feature vector is inputted into CNN SVM exhibit separately, and the average prediction of all taken as the outcome. So moving forward into the experimental result, the model training parameters, basically, the training data set is split into five folds by employing five-fold uh, cross-validation. A simple warm restart technique for stochastic gradient descent is used to enhance its performance while training CNN. The SVM and XEBOOST classifiers are trained separately with the deep learning model, and SVM with RB of kernel is employed. Later, the output of all the three models are combined to generate the average prediction. The neural network weights are initialized using HE norm initialization to refrain the layer activation output from vanishing or exploding during the forward pass through the DNN. Other hyperparameter uh, that we have used for the validation is 25 epochs is what we have used and learning rate is 0 0.01 and it has a batch size of 512. Now looking to our result, if you can see the uh, table, the performance of several CNN architecture was evaluated, so it was not in his, uh, not a random decision where it resulted in uh, taking ResNet 50. We have looked into VGG19, Inception V3, DenseNet V3, uh, ResNet 50, and MobileNet V2. Among all these five, we have also used the evaluation metrics like, uh, like binary cross entropy loss, classification accuracy, ED under curve, and F1 score. Among all these, the loss function, if you look, uh, the ResNet 50 uh, outperformed everything. Accuracy, actually, Inception V3 have them have more, but still ResNet 50 in the top. And AUC, we can see uh, the ResNet 50 overperformed others. And F1 score, actually, VG, uh, VGG19 outperformed others, but still ResNet 50 is, having, is in the top score. So if you look into the overall uh, performance, ResNet 50 is in the A list. So we have choose ResNet 50 and ResNet 50 is buckled with SVM and XE boost in place of the fully connected layer and train them over the CNN output. So the combination of all the three, uh, we have uh, analyzed this as well. We have checked uh, check the performance comparison between ResNet 50 alone, it combined with SVM, it combined with XE boost and the all three together, which is our pr proposed model. And among all the five different, uh, four different methods, our uh, uh, hybrid model outperformed everyone. And hence we uh, suggest this is a good method to implement. Now, before concluding uh, and final discussion. So in the clinical practice, we can see that missed diagnosis and misdiagnosis exist. Why? Because it's human who are doing this process, the radiologists, the medical professionals. So it's definitely prone to error. So our proposed model, an automated ICS detection mechanism hold promise. Uh, this is not a replacement of the existing system, but will enhance the uh, their work as well. And another contribution of this paper is handling of imbalance and multi-label data set. Uh, this medical database are usually imbalanced and hence the adoption of the proper imbalance pre-processing formulation hold promise. This paper proposes excess DNA model, a new ensemble multi-label classifier algorithm for automatic detection and classification of ICH on a huge heterogeneous and imbalanced database of brain CT studies. And talking about the future work, uh, we have to look into the faster optimization techniques for training this model. Uh, it could also include, te uh, include testing with different fusion techniques of the classifier in the proposed hybrid model uh, that could give a better performance in ICS detection. Uh, and the more diversity in the feature extracting neural network could also be included. 
So this is uh, not an end. Uh, uh, this is uh, just a beginning, I must say. And before wrapping up, I would like to thank each and everyone who helped us in study and also thanking everyone who has given us the opportunity to present our paper. Wishing everyone good luck. Let me conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Akita. Any question from participant? Dr. Sastri. Mm, yes, sir. Sure, Akita. Uh, so I just wanted to know uh, whatever the three different classifiers that you have used and combine the results of those. So did you check for overfitting? Uh, yes, sir. That's why we have used those uh, methods like under sampling all these things like where we didn't want our model to create a bias due to uh, this minority classes. So we have checked that. So uh, the model is not overfitting. It's not having a bias. So that's why those method, three different methods were used. This actually handled that imbalances of the data set. OK, uh, my second question was related to that only. So this imbalanced data set. So have you reduced the data set for uh, the class which has more number of samples or increase for the under sampled one? Uh, it's not, not like exactly we have we... Yes, sir. Akita. Uh, uh, sorry, sir, can you hear me? Yes, can you yes, yes, now, now we can hear. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, may uh, I actually didn't hear the question. Can you please repeat the question? I think okay, I missed I, you. I, I, just, I just wanted to know if we have two classes. So what do you do? How did you balance the two classes? I mean, did you reduce the number okay. of samples for, uh, or did you uh, no, reduce no, no, the samples no. for we, the other class? Uh, we actually didn't decrease any of our data set, but we increased the uh, sample of uh, the smallest minority class was increased. We didn't do the opposite. So the count of the total data was not reduced. We use the data augmentation also to uh, make this sure. So that method actually helped in increasing that minority class. Okay, okay fine. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, I have one question. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, can you can you uh, tell me about the data set resource? Uh, it was from radiological. Uh, this was in Northern America. RSNA is the source. It's a public, uh, early available data set. Uh, that is what the source. So if you remember uh, my uh, slide in that I have mentioned uh, regarding that. Like it is the Radiological Society of Northern America uh, in their collaboration with the members of American Society of Neuroradiology and MD.AI. So they have in, uh, they have a public data set. So that is the one we have used. So it's very huge data set, I must say. Uh, does that answer to your question, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other question from participant? Okay. So Dr. Sastri and Dr. Uh, Oliveira, may I ask uh, next uh, paper author? Professor, sure, I have you one question. Okay. My question is reference. Uh, uh, do you do you have you? I one formulation. Okay, have you tested your server if convolutions the neural network is CNE? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is: I, I think this. Uh, do you do you test RNA? Okay. Yeah, we have done I, the validation, sir. That, that, was that the question? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, we have validated I, uh, our sample as well. Sorry, repeat me, please. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, like we have validated, we have used a few set of data. We have uh, split in the whole set into fee for training, uh, fee for testing, and fee for validation. So it is upon that validation data set actually we come up with that analysis, that performance comparison. 
Okay, okay. I think he, I think he and I imagine that C and E you have better results. Okay, I think it's the test in the others, the others neural networks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, thank you so. Thank you so much. Okay, so next uh, paper is uh, with a paper ID 267. Author of uh, paper ID 267, are you there? Vaibhav Bhatia and Mikhe Tripathi. Okay. The last paper is uh, with a paper ID 265. Yes, good evening, sir. I'm there. 265. What's your yes, name? Sir. Prathamesh Lahande. Okay, just a minute. Huh? So you are the presenter now. Yes, uh, let me present my screen. Yes, you can share your screen now. Yes, uh, sir, I'm presenting my uh, my screen, my presentation. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Yes, so a very warm good evening to all the participants and uh, with the kind permission of the session chair, I'd like to present this paper that is reinforcement learning algorithms for effective resource management in cloud computing. Okay. So before going on, jumping on to the uh, the, the, to the main part of the paper, I'd like to introduce what us the research upon. So the main domains that our research basically is on three topics. That is first is cloud computing. So cloud is basically a platform that will give us an opportunity to access and store applications. And today everything that you can access is with respect to cloud computing. The entire performance or the entire working of the cloud computing is dependent on the resource scheduling. So cloud uses resources to provide some services to the user with proper resource management. The cloud's efficiency will be more with improper resource scheduling. The cloud's performance will be hampered. And the third domain is about reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a branch of uh, machine learning. Just like we have supervised learning, we have unsupervised. The third branch is reinforcement learning. The main reason of using reinforcement learning is that you don't require any past data as such. So our research basically will try to improve the resource scheduling by making use of reinforcement learning in cloud computing so that the cloud uh, resources will be better used and all the faults faults uh, on the cloud, they will be reduced. That's why in order to improve the resource scheduling and in order to uh, improve with respect to faults, we have uh, we have proposed and designed this system, a hybrid system, hybrid resource scheduling algorithm known as RL FCFS. So RL stands for reinforcement learning and FCFS stands for first come first serve. So we all might be knowing about first come first serve. That is whoever will come uh, the first in the task queue will be executed. But we are having a hybrid resource uh, algorithm here. And the second one is RL shortest job first. Okay, so these are the two methods that uh, algorithms that we have we are contributing majorly okay so we have tried to develop these two hybrid algorithms so that they can be applied to this cloud computing environment so that the resource scheduling is improved and faults are reduced now coming to the experimental configuration and about the simulation environment so this is the basic architecture of the entire experiment where the user will have some tasks so uh, currently, we have this Alibaba data set that we have used that we are going to shortly see and we have some tasks. Uh, the user has some tasks. The tasks will be submitted to the cloud and the cloud will have the first and foremost that is the task queue. Like I was mentioning two algorithms FCFS and SJF. So FCFS will take that particular task which is first and then SJF will take that one which is the shortest one. After adding to the queue, okay, we will be having these two algorithms. Okay, so these two algorithms are basically implemented using reinforcement learning 
where the learning will be from past data okay reinforcement learning will probably use this q table so we are having a separate data structure called q table so q table is a data structure that will store rewards so with better rewards the system is enhanced and with not better rewards that is negative rewards the system is degraded after this algorithm decides which particular uh, virtual machine to uh, to to execute the task upon it is executed on this virtual machine so this is the entire architecture of our uh, proposed system every task will have these four things task id is creation timestamp its planned cpu and type so what is this type that we are going to see so this is coming to the experimental data set experimental data set we have used real time data that is alibaba task event data set so alibaba is a software company uh, just uh, who is heading by headed by sundar pichai and every task will have four uh, this task will have a, a vector so it will have a task identifier its time of creation planned cpu and it will have its type as well so let me tell you about this so these are the 12 categories that we have if the planned cpu planned cpu is basically amount of time that the task wants to access the virtual machine if it is from 10 to 60 we have categorized it as low from 70 onwards to 300 we have categorized the task as medium so this is medium and above uh, am i audible yes you are audible please continue and, and above 400 we have categorized it as high so every task will either be falling under low category medium category or high category as we can see that the task also has a size so here we are having planned cpu the dominating ones are these these tasks which are basically used so with planned task 50 and this is the task size dominating ones now what are these faults so basically on cloud uh, the cloud basically suffers from lot of faults okay now what are the faults that we have considered for our study is these are the eight faults that we have considered first task is fault is that virtual machine is not available how many times it happens that whatever task we want to submit virtual all the virtual machines are occupied second second one is a uh, security breach so whatever task has been submitted on the cloud it tries to breach some security sometimes virtual machines are deadlock deadlock is basically where all the virtual machines are holding something and waiting for something okay that causes a deadlock so the cloud is uh, collapsed sometimes it happens that a particular task is submitted to the cloud and it is completely uh, suffering from starvation so it is denied service sometimes it happens that our task uh, undergoes some data loss so the cloud will suffer some data loss because of tasks some tasks also ha hack the hack the accounts some they violate the sls and sometimes that it does happen that ram is insufficient so these are all the faults that we have considered so any task that we are going to submit has an equal probability of generating a fault or not generating a fault if it generates a fault between any of these then our reinforcement learning fcfs and reinforcement learning sdf algorithm will solve that problem and then it will try to execute that task coming to the virtual machine co uh, configuration so this is what the, the configuration we have used we have categorized our virtual machine into nine categories so we can see first is low low then we have low medium low high medium low medium 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 high high low high medium and high high so in the first case what happens is we are having five virtual machines so we have used one low low machine and then we have used one medium uh, medium low one medium medium one medium high and then we have used one high high okay like that we are we are taking into consideration 10 cases where every tasks all the alibaba tasks will be executed on separately on five virtual machines then on 10 then on 15 and so on till the 50th virtual machine the main reason of having so many uh, scenarios is because we want to actually test our system that how good or bad it is so these are the number of virtual machines in every scenario now coming to rewards the entire working of reinforcement learning is based on feedback that is rewards so if a particular system is giving you a positive reward then whatever activity that you have done just keep doing it otherwise if it is giving us a negative reward then you have to do some other activity so that the award or the reward can be improved this is just like our a human beings so if something good happens then we get rewarded otherwise we will have to correct our actions so this rewards we have tried to implement it using a q table okay so this is the entire uh, this uh, formula that we have used for calculating the values where alpha value that is 
basically initialized to point nine. That is the learning rate. So alpha is basically learning rate, and gamma is a discount factor. So it will consider the future rewards. And our Q table it looks like this. So this is a data structure. So for every task, okay, we have considered all the virtual machines. And if some task is there, let's say T1, then we will try to actually enhance those rewards, and we will take that reward that is having the maximum reward, and accordingly schedule it to that virtual machine. Let's say virtual machine number three, and then the process will try to automate over a period of time. Now coming to this experimental results. Now experimental results will be obviously like I mentioned, our proposed algorithm will improve the resource scheduling and also improve the faults. So firstly, these are the experimental results. Firstly, with resource scheduling, and you can see that uh, we are taking into consideration uh, par performance parameters. So first is average start time, average completion time, average turnaround time, average waiting time, as well as average cost. So we have done a comparative study as well between RL FCFS as well as RL SJ. That is among them. How do they behave? And from these experimental results, we can see that. With respect to time, RLSJ is performing very nicely. So here we can see that it is uh, performing very nicely. But in terms of cost, okay, RLFCFS performs better. But nonetheless, both the algorithms can be used in order to enhance and minimize the faults and improve the resource scheduling mechanism. Uh, we believe in uh, providing a mathematical uh, this thing also the mathematical help for all these results also. That's why we have done this empirical analysis. Using the mathematical model of R square analysis, and if you can just see here that this is uh, the empirical analysis that we have considered, and again the same thing: parameters, average start time, completion time, turnaround time, waiting time, as well as average cost. And you can see that all the parameters that we have mentioned here, the linear reg regression, you know, the R square value, and all the other things. And this also supports our uh, our uh, study that RL FCFS, RL SJF, sorry, is. Comparatively better with respect to time parameters, but whereas cost is concerned, RL FCFS takes its better place. Coming to fault tolerance, uh, now what are faults that I just mentioned some time before? They are problems due to which the task is hampered or the cloud is hampered. So you can see that here uh, in the first scenario, I'll just talk about a few scenarios because of time limit. So in the first scenario, we are having these many faults out of. We have taken the real-time data set that contains about 80, 90 thousand tasks, and it, so many faults are generated, and only few uh, tasks were there which were generated without any faults. And you can see that the success ratio ratio is much more than what it was before. So this is the case. So without uh, without uh, reinforcement learning, you can see that the ta tasks faults are more, but here the 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 tasks failure is much more less. Okay. So this is the case with fault tolerance. So coming to our contribution and findings, so our proposed algorithm reinforcement learning first sum first serve and reinforcement learning SJ can solve all the faults generated by the tasks. So due to which the cloud performance is enhanced, the cloud becomes more and more reliable. So next time if you want to submit some task, then you will have 100% reliability that it will be executed. Uh, as far as time parameters are concerned, AST that is average start time, completion time, turnaround time, and waiting time, and fault tolerance as well. So RL SJ is performing better than RL FCFS, but in terms of average cost, RL FCFS is performing better than RL SJ. So not only with respect to fault tolerance or resource scheduling, we have tried to compare both these algorithms as well, and ultimately the performance of this is much more greater than that. Okay, so performance of RL FCFS will be any time more than the normal FCFS because it does not have the intelligence, and RL SJ will have much more. priority on with on just sj because it will have much more uh, success ratio so coming to the conclusions okay so we have proposed and compared hybrid resource scheduling algorithms we have proposed two algorithms and they were since they are since i'm mentioning they are hybrid they are combined by using fcfs with rl rl technique so the main reason of using rl uh, you know why we are not using supervised or unsupervised is because no past data is required and the system will adapt from the past experiences just like how we human beings learn the reinforcement learning technique has provided better results when it is applied to any system thereby improving the system and you can see that rl sjf algorithm can be opted in terms of time parameters and rl sjf fcfs can be opted in terms of cost okay 
and both the algorithms can be opted rather than the later one that is fcfs and sjf so we can opt for rl fcfs and rl sjf rather than just the normal one so that the, the resource scheduling is improved the faults are less and thereby we are improving the overall cloud system okay these are the references that we have taken for during this study uh, i'll be very happy to answer any questions i'll uh, stop presenting screen any questions from participant okay dr sastri do you have any question okay so um, <laughs> i simply have uh, one question for samesh uh, i would like to know whether uh, this particular uh, algorithm that you have uh, proposed can we mm -hmm. use this for some other uh, domain also or some other application also or is it specifically designed for only the alibaba no sir the, it is completely platform independent it will work for any data set uh, okay uh, this is just an example that we have thought of doing for this research paper that we have taken alibaba data set but okay. no matter which other data set uh, that you can bring let's say google data set or microsoft our software okay. will be able to uh, adjust to it and it will decrease the number of faults that is firstly and second it will not only decrease the fault but also increase the uh, the in resource schedule thereby okay. improving the cloud performance okay so the, it will be independent of uh, the services also so uh, you can offer different types of services as well for the cloud platform uh no sir it does not offer any different services it okay. will try to give the cloud itself will try to give more number of services because mm -hmm. of this algorithm because ultimately resource scheduling is improved and mm -hmm. the faults are less so it's like an okay. independent so uh, basically it's only uh, it is uh, doing the resource scheduling right so if any mm -hmm. other services uh, uses uh, same resources so the scheduling will be very much efficient and uh, you can implement more number of services on this platform Yes, sir. Absolutely. Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Fine. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes. Doctor Olivera, do you have any suggestion or question? Yes. Yes, Professor. Firstly, congratulations. It's very, very good work. I had, I had two questions. First, reference data set, but it's okay. Uh, you explanation. Uh, do you explanations? I my second questions. It's reference. I think. Uh, what do you expect from this work for the future? Uh, the 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 works of the future. What expect is? Okay. So basically, you're asking about future work, sir. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So future work that we will be testing this system uh, on the sand on a on a platform like Sandbox, so that uh, we can't directly release it right now because users will face a lot of problems and then they will try to not use this. So we will have a platform just like Sandbox, let's say, where we will try to execute the system for some time, and when all the faults are less in number, then we can release it in the market to any anyone, let's say IBM Bluemix or Google Cloud or Microsoft Cloud. Something like that. Okay, okay. Congratulations again. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I would like to also uh, thank uh, Patel sir for all the cooperation that you've given me. And uh, thank you so much for the session chair. It was nice interacting and thank you uh, for giving this opportunity. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, Dr. Sastri and Dr. Olivera, this is the end of uh, this session, technical session as well. Uh, if you have any kind of uh, suggestion or if you want to conclude the session, then it is open for you now. Okay, no, I think uh, as such there are no suggestions, but I would like to conclude it that uh, it was nice hearing from all the participants. All the work which has been presented in this session were really good. I mean, there was also, you know, the mixture of different domains, not only focused uh, on the machine learning, but I can see some real life applications algorithm develop also. So I think it was a very good session. Uh, we learned a lot from this session. So thank you. One more, one more request. Can you turn on your uh, camera?
Can you look? Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Doctor, uh, busy, what? Yes, you are busy. Doctor, okay. Oliver, can you turn on your camera? Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> screenshot. Now, okay. So, Dr. Okay. Oliver, suggestion or any uh, like a kind of if you want to conclude this session, then. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, firstly, congratulations the the excellent event. Congratulations the authors, all authors for excellent work. It's 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 very good work. It's it's different areas, but it's ours. Uh, very good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you so much. Thank you also for sparing your valuable time for us. Uh, thank you very much, sir. OK, thank you. Thank you. So this end of our day one. Thank you, participant, for participating in this uh, IC Softcom 2022. We'll meet again tomorrow morning. So have a nice uh, evening, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome.